in quantum, there is a term used called quantum advantage. And what it actually means is you can do computation with a quantum computer, which you cannot do with a classical computer. And, and that quantum advantage era is, from my perspective, more than 10 years away. I might be wrong, but at this point mm -hmm. of time, it looks like that. We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. Hi there, everybody. This is Mark Verbenkov, and welcome back to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. This is going to be episode number 137, and I'm very excited today to finally say that uh, quantum computing will be touched on on the podcast. I think I did a uh, shorter uh, kind of bird's eye view uh, podcast, uh, solo podcast a couple months ago, but this time I'm going to have a expert guest come on and talk to everybody and to me about quantum computing, how to think about it, what kind of benefits there will be in the future, what kind of uh, specifically challenges, and what kind of things we should be worried about um, with quantum computing. So uh, I'm very excited about uh, the episode, uh, about releasing it. Um, we do touch on kind of what quantum computing is at a, at a very high level. We don't really go into any of the technical details of it. There's a little bit of a technical, uh, well, semi-technical description of what a qubit is, which will be important uh, later on. But uh, as is the theme of the podcast, what we really try to do is touch on the ramifications of this emerging technology, specifically when it will be kind of a, a ubiquitous technology that's used across the, across the world. Uh, we do get into what the challenges are to make this technology feasible, which um, my guest uh, Hamadri does does a really good job in kind of exploring and laying out for all of us. Um, there are a lot of uh, technical problems, of course, to be dealt with, but uh, I think what's more interesting, and, and Hamadri does a great job of this, is touching on some of the other problems, everything from like, uh, do people really understand what quantum computing is and how do we explain uh, what quantum computing is without any kind of real tangible analog to it? Um, and then kind of get into the uh, solutions of those challenges and kind of where the technology will uh, or how it will evolve over the next 10 years and what we can really expect the disruptions and the benefits um, to be experienced by both businesses, but also society at, at kind of a larger whole over the next, say, 10 and even uh, up to 20 years when the technology will be um, really brought out for the for the wider communities uh, on the planet. So uh, really excited to um, release the episode. Uh, I think the conversation was really interesting. Hamadri does a, a great job of explaining um, what I think is one of the more complicated technologies out there. Uh, but it's not, uh, don't get uh, dissuaded. It's, uh, it's a pretty easy to follow discussion uh, while still being quite interesting and engaging. So uh, who is my guest? And touch on that and then we'll, uh, we'll get right into the interview. So Himadri Mahumdar, hopefully I'm not uh, destroying your name there, Himadri, uh, is the co-founder and CEO of Semicon. Hamadri has over two decades of innovation and innovation management experience. So prior to co-founding Semicon, he was the uh, program manager for quantum technologies at VTT. In that role, he led European and Finnish strategic initiatives in quantum technologies. Hamadri was also a founding member of the Finnish quantum technologies ecosystem, Institute Q, and led the business arm of the ecosystem, Business Q. However, at Semicon, his ambition is to lead the company to build the most scalable, affordable, and sustainable quantum processors uh, for quantum uh, computing. He foresees quantum computing and quantum technology in general becoming a Finnish and global success story through cooperation and strategic partnerships. 
And Madhuri is also trained as an experimental physicist with a PhD in applied physics. So I guess we can move on to the podcast itself. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it and get as much out of it uh, as much as I did. Thank you very much. Great. Hi there, Hamadri. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today to talk about quantum computing. As I mentioned just before we started recording, um, it's it's one of the technologies that I think that I've left out of the podcast for far too long. I think I touched on it once, but not with a guest. So I'm very excited to have you on here today to explain everything about quantum technologies and uh, quantum computing. And hopefully we can understand, um, well, everything that there is to need to know by the end of the conversation. So thanks a lot for coming on. Great to be here. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So the way that I like to start um, each of these discussions is really simple. Uh, how did you get involved in this fascinating industry? And was there like a was there an event? Was there a spark? Was there something that kind of drew you towards uh, quantum computing, or was it kind of just a general, uh, natural, organic evolution into the space? Uh, well, it it wasn't organic. So I. It was a conscious choice uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a quick background about myself so that you know how the how the flow came about. So I yeah. have a PhD in applied physics uh, from early 2000s. And since then, I have had many different uh, kind of roles and, and activities. I started as a researcher myself, did the due diligence in the universities, and then joined an organization called BTT, which is the Technical Research Center of Finland. Mm. And uh, first as a scientist doing research as well, hands-on research, leading projects, both European and uh, national. And then uh, I jumped into sales. So I started doing technical sales. And the topic was, at that point of time, microelectronics and nanotechnologies. Okay. And quantum was emerging, but it was not a domain to be sort of understood and, and grasped very easily. And then uh, in that process, I also started leading my sales team and, and so on. But this is when I realized that things started happening uh, around the world. So mm. Google's uh, quantum computing activity started around 2017 and so on. And I started following that field. And then, uh, fortunately, uh, in 2020, uh, Finland and BTT made a conscious strategic decision that they will have a quantum computing program, or let's say quantum technologies program, which okay. is expanded into different domains, including quantum computing. And I, I was uh, lucky enough to be appointed the lead of quantum technologies at BTT. So I took a front row seat, if you mm. may say, mm. in all these activities. And that's how I ended up. Uh, into quantum technologies, not from a perhaps research perspective, but more of a innovation management perspective. Okay, right, right. Um, okay, so I actually just, uh, I came back to Canada from living in Barcelona for, for about seven years. So I'm familiar with the European structure and, you know, uh, Horizon 2020 when, when I was working there, the Horizon program. Right. Um, how... Um, we never worked on quantum uh, technology pro uh, projects before, but how is, uh, say, like Finland compared to other parts of Europe specifically? If, we, if we're just talking about Europe, um, is it is it uh, one of the leaders out there? Is it? Uh, I mean, you, there's this VTT center. Um, how does it? Um, how is it situated within the within the network? Very good question, and and uh, I think one can say without being too uh, sort of, uh, let's say, <laughs> bragging about it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Finland is actually a leader in the yeah. domain of quantum technologies. And the reason for that is uh, a very strong fundamental science called uh, low temperature physics. So whatever you want to do quantum, mostly mm -hmm. you need to be done in, it, it needs to be done in very low temperatures. And, and mm -hmm. That's a kind of domain where Finland has been very, very strong since 1960s. Okay. And okay. that that technological sort of progression and advantage gave Finland a, let's say, a, a front row uh, position in the in that domain. And and this is why uh, when you do quantum technologies uh, or quantum computing, there there is something called enabling technology. So you need a mm. cooler. To do certain things and one of the biggest and best companies in the world doing those coolers is blue force and that emerged from these decades of research that went on in 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 finland 
and and that's kind of like the uh, let's say uh, the the how how the ball rolled from yeah. there yeah. yeah and and that brought finland uh, on the application domain now quite ahead of uh, many countries very interesting i um you know with the with, i've never been to finland I, I did my masters in oslo and i never un, i unfortunately never made it to finland but uh, i assumed you know with the stereotypes of the northern countries being cold that it had something to do with uh with the temperature but i didn't want to make that assumption so i'm glad that i that, that it was correct <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's kind of like yeah. a joke in finland as well that we are yeah. good at two things uh, in research one is low temperature mm -hmm. the other is photonics so one we have uh, abundant of yeah low yeah. temperature the other we don't have that right. until it's summer right. so <laughs> right 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 uh, yeah, that, it it uh, it makes perfect sense. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about the technology itself, right? So, as I mentioned, I did this one relatively short episode uh, just a couple months ago, um, but I haven't really dived into quantum uh, computing specifically. Could you give us like a um, like a bird's eye view of? of quantum computing, quantum technologies. I, I don't know what the right term here is even. Um, just because I'm sure that there's many people that are interested in, in this technology that are going to listen to the episode and aren't, they're not super familiar with the technology itself. Sure, sure. So uh, let, let me uh, break it down a little bit uh, yeah. from, the, from the top. So uh, the original aspect or the bigger term is quantum technologies. And, and that means any uh, kind of technology which uses quantum phenomena or quantum mm. physics as the basis of it. And, and in that sense, this is not very new because uh, from a, we have been using quantum phenomena like tunneling and, and uh, other, other things in, in devices that we hold now. So mm -hmm. for example, GPS uses tunneling phenomena in the hardware level. So this has been around. And that was what we call the quantum one, not zero, where you used quantum technology for quantum devices and sensors uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 to commercialize. But then there are two other things which emerged, uh, let's say, not so long ago, a few decades ago. And one of them is quantum computing. And the other one is quantum communication. And okay. they also use quantum phenomena, but uh, on a different uh, application. And in both cases, you have phenomena like a quantum entanglement and, and, and so on uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the devices that you build. And quantum computing is kind of very, very special because uh, this is something which potentially and hopefully will revolutionize how we look at computing. Uh, one, one way of looking at it is uh, we know how the chips or the semiconductor chips work, and that evolved from memories and, and uh, let's say, traditional chips to GPUs, right, mm -hmm. and graphical processor units. And then now they are evolving into AI chips as well, as they are called. So there are evolution of, uh, let's say, chip technology mm -hmm. and memory technology. But quantum computing is kind of a paradigm shift. So how I explain it to my kids is uh, with, with classical computing or the AI or whatever chips you are working with, they are like when we started uh, in, the, in, the, in the age of bullet carts where you have two wheels and the ox driving it. So that's kind of like doing maths with or computing with Abacus. Right. But then we are as humans have evolved into uh, Lamborghinis. So those are the fastest supercomputers in the world but they are still driven by four wheels or wheels, right? So they mm -hmm. are better cars, but they are still cars. And co quantum computing is something you can compare with, with, a, with a jet uh, air, airplane. So it's a completely different way of traveling in a way. Mm -hmm. You get from place A to B, but you don't use it for everything. You don't go shopping, for example, with, with a jet plane. So quantum computing is kind of like that. So it's a different kind of computing that you use for certain applications Mm -hmm. but you don't do everything with it. And those you can do uh, or use quantum computing for can be amazingly beneficial in terms of speed, in terms of quality of data you get out of it and so on and so forth. Very good. Very good. Maybe one of the best uh, explanations I've, I've had of uh, looking, <laughs> at, looking at the technology. Um, but what, why, don't we, why don't we dive into some of those uh, applications or... Um, some of the exciting things that quantum computing can enable, right? So 
as with most of the technologies that I touch on on the podcast, there's always like, you know, in the future, in the next couple of years, there's going to be all of these benefits that are going to be realized, you know, with uh, autonomous vehicles, which is one of the typical ones, right? You can have, you know, the elimination of uh, rush hour traffic, for instance, right? That's one thing that people are always interested in. And it gives, it gives a real tangible aspect of the technology when we're talking about it. Um, could you dive into some of those kind of maybe unforeseen or foreseen benefits of quantum computing so that people have a little bit of a tangible connection to it? Absolutely. And, and you are right, because uh, in, if, you, if uh, your readers or, or listeners uh, look into uh, or Google quantum computing, you can yeah. see many different ways they ca it can be applied. But uh, what is essential is to understand what are the benefits uh, that actually come from it. There are things like uh, that you see or listen or, or or read about is it will affect uh, medicines, it will affect chemistry, it will affect logistics, it will affect uh, 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 transportation. It will there will be many many different effects of of quantum, mm -hmm. but it boils down to a few fundamental things that quantum computing does uh, better than classical computing or mm -hmm. or traditional computers, even super supercomputers. Uh, for example. And what we are hoping for, if I give you an example of it, is, uh, for example, uh, when a tornado uh, in US is, is predicted, you, you see a tornado path in the news, but you see a very wide cone, mm -hmm. and you don't know where it's going to hit. You can, it's, it's impossible for climate modeling uh, scientists or any computer that does those modeling to say ac accurately which way it's going to go or where it's going to hit. So that's a big computational problem because there are so many parameters in there that if you want to compute, including all the parameters, the computation time will be enormous. Mm -hmm. So the tornado will pass before you get the actual data out of the computer that where it's going to hit. So that's not, that's not uh, practical. So what they do is they compromise a few parameters. So they take less variables. And what that gives is a kind of wide choice literally that where yeah, it can go yeah. but what we can possibly uh, see with quantum computing when it's when it's uh, in its true form is we can do calculation with a lot more variables and get the information out not in hours or days but in minutes or even seconds mm -hmm. so that is the let's say the biggest impact i personally think that if you can predict uh, tornadoes or, or tsunamis or whatever that are natural uh, phenomena. And you can save lives. You literally can save lives with those things, right? So climate uh, or weather modeling or weather prediction is one. And, and the same way you can, so what we call it uh, from a technical perspective, it's optimization problem. So you have many different parameters you optimize to figure out what's the outcome of that. And then you can imagine any industry which has a optimization problem will benefit from it. So it's it's batteries, materials, uh, chemistry, which leads to drug discoveries. Mm. Anything and everything with uh, optimization will be affected. Really interesting. So the the potential yeah benefits and, and application areas are almost uh, I don't know if it, unlimited is the right word, but certainly vast in their in their uh, areas that, that this uh, technology can touch on. So um I want to maybe also tie this into some of the more recent news. And I've, I've touched on AI quite a bit because that's the hype and that's what people want to hear about, right? Um, right. I believe it was um, Microsoft's DeepMind that just came up with, I think, like uh -huh. four and a half new million meta materials, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh -huh. invented them, and now they're being verified in the lab. So, uh -huh. you know, when you're talking about... Um, uh, quantum computing impacting like batteries and things like that. I would also assume that these kinds of new materials would be um, would be impacted by quantum computing or that there would be some sort of um, maybe not merging, but certainly some kind of interplay between the AI and quantum computing, maybe enabling the AI to do some of these calculations. Could you could you tie those ideas together? Uh very difficult, but I can try. <laughs> or, or or eradicate the idea and explain what I should be thinking. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. 
uh, I mean, it's it's uh, pretty much at this point of time a conjecture, but still, I mean, mm. we, we have to have a vision of what we are trying to achieve. So in that sense, what I would say is you were right. So AI can predict uh, different materials or metamaterials or, or, or uh, things like that. And, and then you have to figure out so let's say let's take the example of uh, uh, molecules, right? Things that you use to build drugs or, or pharmaceuticals uh, for mm -hmm. medicines or diseases. So how it works in the medicine uh, or pharmaceutical industry is you start with perhaps a thousand molecules trying to address a, a solution for a disease. And then you filter out the molecules uh, depending on what their structure is, how their uh, kind of uh, chemical bonds and the chemical angles and, and so on affect uh, the, the disease that you are eradicating. And there are, again, thousands of parameters that you have to look into a molecule uh, or a complex molecule to figure out how that works. So even if you bring out these metamaterials or, or, or uh, different options uh, from an AI perspective, it does not have all the calculations done yet because all it predicts is based on data that is old, right? So mm -hmm. it's based on known data. So there are a lot of unknowns which, which comes out with that. And what quantum computers can do is perhaps take those metamaterials and then analyze it with different parameters to figure out which is actually truly achievable. So sure. that would be my kind of way of looking at it or tying them together. In a way. Okay. Okay. That's uh, m much better than the way I was thinking about it. <laughs> 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 um, so like with any of these uh, emerging technologies that I cover on the podcast, right? There's, it, ju it just seems like there's phenomenal benefits for, for individuals, for nations, for companies uh, in, in the coming future. Um, but there's always challenges to get there. Uh, mm -hmm. it, I've never interviewed anybody that says, you know, the path to this wonderful future vision of this technology is, is an easy, you know, uh, one or two steps. It sounds like there's many steps and there's hurdles along the way. Right. Um, and I think that that's always really interesting to hear about. So because each industry, each technology has its own unique kind of challenges. Um, right. I can assume that with quantum uh, computing, a lot of those challenges are going to be technical. Um, but maybe there are some other ones. Could you could you dive into some of the challenges? Uh, I think that'd be very interesting to hear about. Uh, yes, uh, you, you are absolutely right. And and technical challenges are big, and and mm. they are different kinds, uh, which I can uh, elaborate a little bit. But I, I I think what you said is very interesting. That there are other challenges as well, non technical challenges. And I think these are these are important to address. And mm -hmm. one of the one of the one of those challenges is how do we make people understand quantum technologies? Because it's it's very mathematical. You cannot yes. have a classical analog to make people understand how it actually works. Because a very common question I get from people is how does it work? And then I try to explain to them the, 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 the ideas of uh, qubits and so on, but it does not resonate because there is no classical equivalent of yeah, it. Yeah. And, and this is something that uh, as a society, uh, we have to educate early enough to prepare people for the quantum era. And, and that is important. Mm. And in this day and age, when it's very hard for us to even, uh, or it's, it's kind of a truth that, what we see, we sometimes don't believe either, right? We, we are in an era like that. So how can you make people believe which is not uh, physically visible? And, and, and uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's one challenge. And the second challenge, which is true for any new technology, is, is the fear factor, mm -hmm. how it's going to affect me. And from quantum perspective, uh, one thing that people have been... Uh, talking about is quantum computers are going to wreak havoc on cryptology or cryptography and, and destroy all cryptographic keys that exist right now. That potentially is true. There is an algorithm which can do that, but we are nowhere close with the hardware to be able to, be able to do that. So it's a problem, but a problem a bit into the future. And there are steps being taken to develop further new uh, cryptography methods that can withstand those quantum mm. uh, effects or, or quantum attacks, let's say. 
So that's also something people need to understand and educated about that there, there is, it's not a doomsday scenario uh, in, in, in that sense. And the third aspect, uh, uh, I would say, is, is the geopolitical aspect. And, and that is even more uh, short term and, and, and critical because it, it's, it's a point where we are reaching, uh, where we are weaponizing quantum technology or quantum computing as well. I mean, all the global leaders are in this race, right? So th there is this potential of limiting our capacity or limiting our path of, of growth in quantum by regulating, by creating barriers, which are not necessarily true barriers. Regulations are important. Standards are very important for any new technology. Mm -hmm. You have to have them. But if you don't understand the technology well enough, the fear factor comes in and you stop things uh, early enough. And, and that's uh, detrimental. And this might actually cause more harm then uh, let's let's put it this way. Uh, there are friendly countries and there are unfriendly countries. And the, if the friendly countries try to regulate strongly development, that what that would mean is they are stopping researchers in those countries to develop quicker, right? But the unfriendly countries are not going to stop. They are going to do it. So at the end of the day, we might be farther away from the finish line than they are just because we wanted to be careful and, and, mm -hmm. and we wanted to do things right. But we did it, we did something which was not necessarily what we knew very well would be the case. So it's a lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, which, which leads to that. So that, those are the non-technical ones. Do you want me to continue with the technical? Uh, I, I do want to get into the technical ones. Okay. Uh, um, to an, to an extent, of course, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I just want to go back on this um, this idea of the nations. I think you used the term like weaponizing the, this technology. Um, yeah. How? So I understand the the um, uh, cryptographic problems and issues coming up. Is that what you mean by them weaponizing this in order to break into I don't know personal data center, uh, personal data data centers, etc. Is is that like the main way that uh, quantum computing can be used, or are there other ways that it could be used, uh, kind of as a detriment or as a as a weapon, if you right. will? Right. So what I meant by weaponizing is, uh, in well, in case of cryptography with digital uh, sort of uh, attacks, is it's a it's a weapon in that yeah. sense, but it's it's also a economic weapon. So if you if one country gets an advantage, economic advantage uh, with quantum computing then they can use it to their advantage, right? So in that sense, it's economic uh, benefits or weaponization in that sense. So it's not all literal. It's also mm. uh, affecting, uh, I mean, there will be uh, potentially social uh, benefits uh, or, or social detriments, and there will be economic detriments. Okay, that makes sense. That's clear. Um, yeah, to, to me, it sounds like the, the more that I listen and read about quantum computing, there's a lot of parallels between it and artificial intelligence, like a lot of the same right. kind of concerns right. and uh, geopolitical concerns. Um, yeah, very interesting. You are right. Yeah. You are right. Um, okay, let's dive into some of the technical ones, because I know that, that that's a really good segue into exactly what you're doing and uh, what, your, what your company is working on. So um, one of the things that we communicated about before is the... Um, uh, how expensive quantum computing is, right? So this is, it's either Google or huge other research organizations or um, or nations, as you've talked about. I don't think there can be a, a small startup, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I don't think I can go and build a quantum computing uh a quantum co computer in my in my garage and have yeah. a and have a, um, a successful startup that way there needs to be substantial funding and as you said yeah. enabling technologies to to have this happen so um well maybe we can start there yeah you, you are absolutely right it, this is uh one of those things that you need some initial investment in because uh things that you need as enabling technologies to start doing quantum computing are are quite expensive right now and so, so if we if we start with uh, a typical structure of a quantum computer, what you need is uh, whether it's IBM, whether it's Google, whoever is building it, is you you need a a a cryostat or a 
glorified fridge, if I call it. <laughs> and, and what it does is it cools down uh, the, the processor which you put in, into it uh, to a temperature which is close to absolute zero, or let's say 100 times less than, uh, to, closer to absolute zero, so millikelvins range, right? So that's a very demanding uh, fridge, and that's expensive. So that's where the yeah. first step of, of uh, uh, costs come in. And then uh, you, once you have the chip uh, inside the fridge, you have to uh, get information in and out of that chip. And what you do, what, what is done typically now, is you use cables. Uh, they use cables to connect uh, to the chip, and you read it out with another cable, and, and so on. And those cables are special because they cannot have too much electrical noise in them. Otherwise, you lose the quantum information. So those cables are also expensive. So they add up to the cost. So if you have larger number of uh, qubits in a processor, the prices of the cables go up as well. And then the same way, the cables are then coming out of the fridge and connected uh, in room temperature to a, to a measurement rack. And there you have a measurement the sort of instruments which are reading the quantum information. And they also have to be very able to have very low noise in them, electrical noise. That is expensive. So they add up to the other costs. So all these things uh, spiral into a cost which is uh, not affordable for anybody or everybody to start building a quantum computer. And that, that's why it's, it's a very special field. And, uh, what uh, if I if I may say this? Uh, so what we are trying to do in Semicon uh, as a company is to mm. bring that down as much as we can, and and that way democratize the the way that quantum computing can be done, and and not make it uh, as a, a privilege of a few, but more researchers can can have access to. It. But I will come back to that later. But this is mm -hmm. how how it it actually stands now that it's an expensive endeavor to, to me it sounds like um uh, you know i i have uh, older family members obviously and they were telling me about the the computers that they were using when they were younger and right. uh, just humongous behemoths that only you know a, a really well equipped school or you know some sort of government building or a big mm -hmm. lab was able to to afford um so it sounds like i mean this is Moore's law, right? Uh, as technologies um, uh, increase in capabilities, also the price comes down, and you know now we have right. we have these wonderful things uh, that's you know exactly. probably probably a million times more powerful than those giant behemoths back in the day. So, uh, I guess the same sort of thing is happening with um, with quantum computers. Yeah. It is, and uh, that's a perfect analogy to start with because uh, this room filled with uh, uh, computers from 1960s that sent us to the moon is basically where at a stage quantum computing is now as mm -hmm. an equivalent. So now, uh, and, and this is exactly, I'm glad that you brought up the, the aspect of a mobile phone because yes, it is a very, very powerful computer and, and it's amazing what it can do, right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't happen overnight. It happened with the invention of the IC chips and, and, and that's what uh, triggered. So integrated circuits, being able to condense everything in a, in a small uh, footprint at an affordable price is what led to that. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are trying to do with Semicon as well. So if you, if you want to do quantum computing, the, the heart of it is the quantum processor that you put in a fridge. And what we are trying to do is make that quantum processor into a quantum IC. So when you want to build a quantum computer, you just take a processor or this quantum IC chip, you plug it in, and voila, you will have a quantum computer uh, built out of it. You will, put, you will still need a fridge, but mm -hmm. what we are trying to do is build a smaller fridge. And, right, and right. in some cases, we are we are saying that our our quantum computers or the quantum computers built with our processors will will operate at space temperature. So you can have them in space and still operate it as a quantum computer, for example. <laughs> so so uh, no smartphone, no quantum computing smartphone in the next couple of years, but not, there could be not space yet. space quantum computers. Very cool. That, that's, that's <laughs> my, that would be a great step if we get there. And then comes the mobile phone version of it. Right, right. Oh, right. yeah, I, I, can, I can also, uh, yeah, there, there are potential research going on in that direction. So if you can do the cooling on chip as well, but that's, for far further away right right um 
Okay, very interesting. So um, do you see maybe in the next, I don't know, 10 years is such a such a uh, normal timeline that we look at, right? As humans, it's it's always five to 10 years, although with things, uh, the way things are progressing, that's getting uh, harder and harder to see out that yeah. far. But do you, like, do you see, um, say, like startups being able to use quantum computers, like have their own quantum computers in the next 10 years? Will the price drop that much or is it is it going to take longer than that? Um, the, and the reason that I ask is I, I've interviewed a lot of people with uh, with regards to the new space age. Right. And it's mm -hmm. it's um, there are a lot of startups there, but there's also this is kind of the first time that. Um, businesses are able to do space flight and we see all the kind right. of like interesting things that are happening there. So I'm assuming that if we're able to move quantum computing more and more into the private sector, there's going to be a lot yeah. of more uh, kind of, I guess you could say explosions in the uh, good explosions, right? The the new trends and the yeah. new things that are happening with quantum computing. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah, I think so as well. And, and uh, it, it, uh, you, you are absolutely right. It boils down to uh, price, uh, but there is a factor of quality as well, which I will come in a minute, but mm -hmm. the price is, is a driver because what, again, uh, what we are trying to do is bring down the price of the processor. And, and if, if uh, the, let's say, if you need a smaller fridge, the cost of the fridge goes down. If you have a processor, which is cheap, and you can replace the cables and everything that you have to buy, that then the price goes down. And if you can replace the, the external uh, readout electronics with the chip as well, even further goes down. And what we what we what I would be our first step is give this chip to the to the community to build quantum computers which are affordable. And at this point of time, the bottleneck from a price perspective is the processor mostly. And if we can do that with a smaller fridge, then there will be a lot of players coming in trying to build quantum computers. And this is what we want to do. And that will start putting the price down in, in, in a way. But then there is this other parallel aspect of quality or, or the mm -hmm. computational capacity of quantum computers. And there, I think uh, we are uh, not there yet. And even in 10 years, if I may dare say, we might not get there either. Okay. So in quantum, there is a term used called quantum advantage. And what it actually means is you can do computation with a quantum computer which you cannot do with a classical computer. And, and that quantum advantage era is, from my perspective, more than 10 years away. I might be wrong, but at this point of time, it looks like that. So what we are uh, hoping for from a business perspective is there will be something called a business advantage, not a quantum advantage. And what it means is, like I mentioned at the beginning, those uh, companies who have logistical problems that they use supercomputers to compute and takes time, so if you have a logistical company where computation takes, let's say three hours to do, and if you add, now if you add a quantum computer to it, if you are able to add computation there, if you can bring it from three hours to an one hour or even half an hour, that's a huge business advantage. You save a lot of money. You can do a lot for, more for your customers. And, and this is the era that might happen in the next 10 years, that we'll start seeing that effect uh, slowly coming in. But okay. it's again, it's it's not it's not easy. It, it's a hard path to get to that point uh, as well. I I really uh, appreciate what IBM has been doing over the years. They have been they have a roadmap and they have been hitting that very okay. nicely. But it's 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 good for the community. But there are there are challenges ahead uh, for all of us there as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean from. From my little podcast here, you know, listening to all the kind of challenges for any emerging technology, it's uh, uh -huh. it's it sounds like some of these are are absolutely monumental, and it's uh, I'm really amazed when, as you said, like milestones are hit or new advancements are made. It's uh, um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's pretty fascinating to be honest. Um, I ha had one question uh, to follow up on there. So this quantum um, advantage that you were saying, yeah, how wide is that advantage? Um, I, you, you said that the advantage doesn't necessarily exist right now, um, but how wide will that advantage exist in, say, 10 years? And the reason I'm asking that is, as I see it, 
traditional computing is going to continually grow. Yep. Is that is that gap going to widen or narrow as time goes on? And will there be a point where quantum computing will be, I hate to say it, like as good as uh, traditional computing? Or is that gap so wide that even in 10, even in 20 years, uh, quantum computing will just vastly outperform um, traditional computers? Uh not in 10 years, perhaps, but in 20 years, yeah, yeah. I, I would say it will vastly outperform uh, classical computers when we reach the quantum advantage. That's for sure. But then again, it's going to be outperforming for certain things, right? not for right. everything. So we will still need the classical computer for many things that we do, but in some cases, it will be completely outperformed by the quantum computer. Right. Okay. Well, th I think that's a key thing to, to remember that uh, quantum computers won't take over every type of computing, but there's just those specific places that is useful. Right. Okay. Right. Um, we talked about, uh, and maybe this is touching on uh, what you were talking about a little bit before, but uh, semiconductors versus superconductors. So mm -hmm. um, this has to do with the, the chip technology. Uh, do you want to just explain that a little bit for, for me and, uh, and, for, and for the audience, because I think that's kind of a key point here. It, it is, it is. And I think it's important to understand uh, because uh, generally speaking, quantum computing, uh, it, it, it means many different things. And, and that's why uh, it's, it's important to understand the difference. And there are two aspects of difference. One aspect is what are the technologies? And the second aspect is how you do the computing. And, and the first one, uh, what are the technologies? Uh, as you said, there are superconductor-based quantum computers, which are prevalent now. Google does that, IBM does that, and, 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 and other, many other, Rigetti and, and other companies do that, IQM in Finland doing that. But then when it comes to ways of doing quantum computing, there are many other ways. The first actual uh, way when it was demonstrated is based on something called ion traps. and and that is a strong potential candidate for quantum computing as well. And, and uh, they use different methods, different technologies. So in, in, in ion traps, you use a ion and you trap it in a vacuum and you try to read it with a laser, very simplistically say. Mm -hmm. In super, superconductors, you have a superconducting circuit, uh, which at low temperature operates uh, as a super, superconductor and you then manipulate it to do computing, uh, quantum computing. And then there are photonic solutions. So, so companies like Xanadu, for example, in Canada and, and uh, some other companies in Europe are trying to do that. And, and there you use photonic circuits to do quantum computing. Uh, there are other, other methods which are there as well. And one of, one of them that we are doing is, is the se semiconductor uh, spin. So every semiconductor material or the semiconductor material of silicon, let's say, have a, has a spin and you can manipulate that spin to do compute, quantum computing as well. And the reason we are fascinated by the semiconductors is first of all, the whole world's classical computing is driven by semiconductors or silicon. So the process is there, the manufacturing units are there, everything, the, the, the supply chain is there. So everything exists. Mm -hmm. So if we can use that same material to do quantum computing, we don't have to reinvent the, the value chain, the supply chain, the, the infrastructure, anything. We can just repurpose it for quantum computing. And this is where our uh, sort of effort comes in, because that is the simplest and easiest way to bring down the cost, for example. Right. And then there are some te technical advantages of using silicon. Be challenges are there as well, of course. But those are the things that makes semiconductors very, very interesting. And from a superconductor, photonic, and other aspects, my take on that is that they are doing a fantastic job in showing what quantum computing can do at this point of time. They are growing. They will, you will see 1,000 qubits and, and more coming up uh, there. But at some point of time, there will be a scalability issue. How mm. can you build big machines? I mean, you cannot keep on building bigger and bigger machines. And, and this scalability aspect can, from our perspective, be best handled by semiconductors, that you can scale the technology and, and have lots of thousands and thousands of qubits 
to 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 build quantum computers and 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 that's that's uh, one angle and then the second aspect that i mentioned is the quality of the qubits right so there are two different approaches in the community one approach is if you build one qubit it will operate like a qubit uh, which is logical so it's called a logical qubit so, and it's, it's sorry, sorry to cut you off but uh, could you explain to the audience what a qubit is <laughs> Maybe oh, just, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I should have done that a long time ago. So yeah. the qubit is the equivalent of a bit. So in, in classical computers, there is something called a bit, which is a transistor or, or a switch, which goes from zero to one. And that's mm -hmm. the that's how we how we compute, how we program the quant computer. But in quantum computer, you don't have something called zero and one. You have something different, which is a probabilistic factor between zero and one. It can be something between one, zero and one, and you have to read it. Let's stop there because otherwise we go. Yeah, and yeah. Go. <laughs> I, I, I remember trying to explain that in, in the solo episode that I did. I was like, well, I'm going to give it my shot, but I don't, I, like, I understand it to a certain degree, but I also don't fully understand good. it. But uh, yeah, yeah. Good. I think, I think it's a good point to say that if somebody is interested in Qubit, they should go and uh, yeah. listen to that episode. From perfect. Yeah, yeah perfect. <laughs> And and then uh, so that's that's the basic building block. So you need qubits to compute. So if you have a qubit, that means you can program. So that's that's how it works. And when you build a qubit on a on a hardware on a device, that's what we call a physical qubit. But that physical qubit can have uh, let's say errors. So it can have uh, it can perform uh, very well or it can perform poorly. And what there are two aspects of it. You can either put all your effort to make that physical qubit as good as possible so that it becomes the best qubit ever. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of doing it. And and some some uh, quantum computing methods actually try to do that. So they try to build the purest of the qubits possible. And then there are some uh, like us who believe there is some let's say 60% or 70% is good enough that it's good enough as a quality and then what we do is we take lots of these physical qubits we make them work together and give one good qubit working together so let's say a thousand physical qubits will work together to give you one good logical qubit okay and that's that's the second approach and that means it's well, it's it's hypothesized that the world needs maybe 300 to 400 good, pure qubits to run everything that we want to run, right? Wow. So the race wow. is on from two sides. The pure, pure qubit uh, groups are trying to get to the 300 qubits, pure qubits. And we are saying, forget about purity. Let's build as many qubits as possible. And then we make them work together to get to that 300 quicker. So... <laughs> Very interesting. We, we don't know who is going to win, but it's 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 a game on in both yeah, sides. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, maybe maybe that goes perfect, or it's a great segue into kind of like the the last uh, question or two here. Uh, also, notice sure. time is is uh, coming down. Um, what about the the geo, uh, geopolitical consequences of this? Right. So you're saying that the race is on, and I'm assuming mm -hmm. the race is on between different countries that have different perspectives on this. And because of those different countries, there are going to be different kinds of regulations and uh, right. you know, walls that are being put up, tariffs and whatnot. Um, you, you mentioned about this uh, before the recording. Can you, can you expand on, on that idea? Because I think that's something that is tangible that everybody can understand, <laughs> um, maybe a little bit easier yeah. than, than the whole quantum technology uh, discussion. Uh, absolutely, and 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 this is this is important because uh, so let's put it let's give you uh, give your audience a few examples. So when when we are talking about a fridge, a dilution fridge, uh, for example, you need a a gas called helium. Helium uh, is 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 available around the world, but there is a certain isotope which is needed. Helium three is is, is the isotope, and that is rare. So those countries who are sitting on helium-3 can completely disrupt the supply chain by saying, nope, we are not going to export. And then the other countries are in big trouble saying, okay, what do we do? We cannot progress because there is a regulatory aspect. It's the same thing uh, when, when certain countries are having the rare arts that we use in batteries and so on, right? right. So it's the same kind of uh, uh, 
snowball effect on on the industry. So that's that's one, and and there are other things as well. So for for example, in in some other industries, or let's say some other way of doing semiconductor qubit, you need a material called silicon twenty eight. So again, a special isotope, and they are rare as well, and and you can only find them in certain places globally. So what happens if they squeeze the supply chain? That's that's a problem. So these kind of things are extremely, extremely problematic and, and can potentially disrupt or skew the balance in, in, in certain direction. So mm -hmm. it's it's good to understand them. And, and for governments, I think what they are trying to do is uh, find alternative methods. So there is every not every not putting everything in one basket, but trying to figure out different ways to do it. So you don't have the possibility of being held hostage to a certain thing or certain right, right. aspect. So I think this is, in the short term, this is going to be very important uh, from regulatory or, or any other export control or whatever perspective it is. Right. So like, uh, well, like many other technologies, it seems like the geopolitical landscape will either hinder or accelerate the development of, of this technology um, based on what you were saying. Right. Very interesting. Um, uh, yes, uh, it, and, and it's also dependent on what exactly you want to do uh, with, with the technology. So, for example, I mentioned the Silicon 28. So what we are trying to do in the company is get uh, ourselves decoupled from that so that we don't have a dependency on that only. We can operate even if that uh, is not available. So those are strategic business decisions for companies or startups to make anyway. We've touched on the so uh, the, the podcast, the future tech and foresight, right? A, a big part of it is always looking towards the future and trying to uh, help, well, I guess, mm -hmm. the average listener, but also people within business that listen, um, how to kind of position themselves for the emerging technologies that are going to create a lot of disruption. Right. Um, if you're saying it's maybe still another 10 years or so out before we can really start to use or like the the maybe not the average person, but, you know, uh, quantum computing can move into the uh, uh, the private realm. Um, is there a way of businesses that are, or, or maybe even younger entrepreneurs can start to position themselves or think about how yeah. to build businesses with the upcoming um, quantum computing possibilities? Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe it's just a an understanding of what this technology is capable of first. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I, I think uh, the time is now. And, and the, the reason I'm saying it is, is uh, the way we behaved or we started the company as well. And, mm -hmm. and it's important to understand that, yes, there are big giants like Google, uh, IBM, Intel, others, uh, are, who are working in this domain. But the interesting part is that the playing field is level. The giants are not too far away from what small companies can do. So this is the opportunity, if you have a good innovation and, and good, uh, let's say, idea to go with it, to, to run as fast as you can so that you can outpace the, the giants. And, and then you are really, really valuable. So mm -hmm. we are looking at a, uh, at a era where we can see emergence of new companies, new big companies coming out. I mean, it's the same with the AI hardware, right? <laughs> NVIDIA and, and others came out like that. So this is where quantum computing is now. So it's the time to build that. And then the second aspect is, if you are not in the core of the quantum, let's say technology part, big aspect of room temperature electronics, room temperature aspects as well. So you can be a system integrator who buys the chip from someone and you build the whole machine, right? So there is a bit, big business, business potential there. So I think that's something uh, is, is something uh, for new companies to explore or even uh, existing companies who are building electronic components to explore as well. That if What's going to happen? Because what is true, no matter which way you go in the business, is quantum has a very long learning curve. So mm -hmm. if you start now, you will be ready in 10 years. So if you think it cannot be your main business, that is understandable, but start doing it as a, as a side stream in a way. Right. It won't generate the biggest revenues now,
but in future you will be well positioned to actually capitalize on that very interesting it uh, it reminds me a little bit about uh, how the americans were thinking about going to the moon right they had the technology wasn't ready but they were planning right. to build what uh, what was it they're, they're building for the technologies that were coming out um you know, very uh, interesting way of thinking about uh, building well, whether it's a space program or a company or or the future, I guess you could say in general. Indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, and may maybe do you have, um, I know that there's a couple of young people that listen to the podcast. Uh, do you have maybe some good resources of where people could go and learn about quantum computing? I mean, obviously, university is probably uh, one of the best places because it's a little bit more of a technical thing to, to yeah. learn. But are there, like, maybe to... to um, What's the expression? Uh, get get your toes wet or dip your toe yeah. into it. Uh, do you have some good resources? Yeah, uh, I I can. Uh, well, if you are a non technical or or let's say you are not deep into technical, then one good place to start out, uh, start with is uh, giving a shout out to my good friend Worley. Is uh, there is a book uh, called Quantum Computing for Dummies. Perfect. <laughs> It's a very good book. I, I actually am reading it still. So it, it's it's a good book to start. Uh, how 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 to understand quantum computing and how to how to see it works, and then you can uh, sort of quote unquote graduate yourself to a bit more technical uh, uh, aspects where you can read about. Uh, so there are uh, uh, let's say blogs by uh, Professor Aronson. Uh, which which is very good. He mm. he explains. Uh, he ha also has a book, uh, Quantum Computing from Time of Democritus. So th that's also a very good book to read. So there are multiple of these resources, which I think I can uh, provide, and you can put yeah. it in the the podcast as well yeah. as, as yeah, references. Sure. So those are good good place to start. Perfect. Um... Well, Hamadri, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I think that's a perfect place to uh, to end things. Um... So we'll have your uh, website up on the show notes as well. Are there any other places that you uh, prefer people to come and check out your work, uh, see what uh, see what your company's up to? Yeah, please feel free to visit our webpage, www.semicon.tech, with T-E-C-H. And, and uh, I'm sure you will find some information and resources there as well. Perfect. Thank Easy you. enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for coming on. It was... Uh, it was great to have my mind opened up a little bit more about uh, quantum technologies and, and quantum computing in general. So thanks. Well, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here, there are, of course, a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future-shocked people and future-shocked institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is superintelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the superintelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10-year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's going to reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization. 